This is the fourth and final video in a series of videos on analyzing screening designs. And prior to uh, watching this video, you should have watched the three previous videos. You should have read the screening design notes parts three and four. And you should have read the uh, case study in chapters two and three of Hoos and Jones. In the previous video, we covered what's called all possible models analysis of a screening design. And from that, we discovered the potential, um, based on BIC exists, that there may be a large model. In fact, BIC really honed in on models with eight terms. And I said those models appear overfit. And in fact, if an eight term model were actually the correct model uh, or best model, then that would indicate effect sparsity is not holding. And at this point, we need to consider augmenting the design. Okay. And if we weren't to do that, then at the very minimum, if we went with that larger model, we'd have to do a series of independent confirmation trials and see if indeed that design might work. But we've covered augmentation before, so we're not going to spend too much time on it. And I'll point out, if you look at the Hoos and Jones uh, discussion on page 52, from all possible models analysis and looking at the results, they felt that there were a series of six possible two-way interactions. So what we're going to do is go over to jump at this point. And I'm going to call up the original um, extraction experiment design. Go to the DOE menu. Select augment design. And again, I'm going to use all six of my main effects. And we have a single response yield. So we're given a series of options. Again, I'm going to group runs into a new block. And I'm going to select augment because I'm going to actually specify the model that I want to estimate based on the Hoos and Jones um, recommendations. So I click augment. And automatically, the main effects are put in. But there are six interactions that they recommended. Okay. So one of them was methanol and time. So I'm going to select methanol from the factor table, time in the model table, and click cross. Okay. Then they re recommended methanol and butanol. So I'm going to click on butanol and cross that term. And next, let's see, they recommended time in butanol. Okay. So I'm going to take a look in the factor table and select time and cross time with butanol. Okay. They then reckon, recommended ethanol and butanol. So I'm going to select ethanol and butanol and cross. Then they selected ethanol and propanol. So again, I'll select ethanol and propanol and cross. Okay. And then finally, propanol and time. So I'll select time from the uh, factor table and cross it with propanol in the model. And there's our model with the six trials. And originally, we had 12 runs. And we now need enough runs to estimate the effects that we're interested in. And we could probably do this in as little as six extra trials. Okay. So we go down, um, enter number of runs. And I'm going to put in, let's see, how many do I want to add? So I'm going to say 20 total. Okay, That gives us enough degrees of freedom to estimate the six interactions and the blocking effects. So I'm going to pick 20. Then we would make the design. Okay. 
And at this point, I would make the table. So these are the additional trials that have to be run. But it turns out in the case study, they've already done these uh, trials. And by the way, I could, when I run the model script, there is the model that was defined when I created the design. So I'm going to close the augmented design table that I created and go to the actual design. So this is the augmented extraction DOE and the largest possible model that we could fit. Again, the actual by predicted plot leads us to one to suspect this model may be overfit. Okay. And we can look through the terms in the model. So this is one possible model. But again, we have a lot of models we could select from. So a natural choice would be to once again go through the all possible models approach. And I have done that in a previous video, so I'm not going to redo all possible models for you. You step through the same procedures and pick a series of models. And here is a fit group that I created from all possible models okay, that contains six possible models of various sizes. Okay. So these start from larger to smaller models. Again, by the way, this is one model, a nine-term model. And notice that does really look to be overfit. But at this point, what we could do, since we have all of these models, rather than just simply pick one of them, is I could save all the prediction formulas to the data table. Okay. And here are the models. By the way, one of these is the BIC model. That actually is quite large. Okay. And But I did save it. And then we had a series of models. Uh, the best AIC, and then I picked a series of other BIC models. And the question is, what models might be best? Well, one thing that's increasingly happening in statistical modeling is, what if instead of picking one of them, I selected all of them? And all of them have some prediction capability. Some are smaller, some are larger. So some might be overfit. Uh, none of these are likely to be underfit. There was no actual evidence of underfitting. But I've saved all of the prediction formulas to the data table. And if you go to the Analyze menu, Modeling, Model Comparison, okay. Okay. get that out of our way you put in your prediction formulas. So my formulas are best AIC. That would be the smallest. And then I have my uh, three, let's see. Just making sure I have all of them I need here. Okay, so I have the best AIC, I have three others, best uh, BIC, and let's see, that should be enough. And there's one more I'll add. So I'm going to click OK. And notice you get uh, this column root average square error. Okay, this indicates uh, which has the overall smallest prediction error. And again, be careful because overfit models will tend to have a small error. But this tends to like formula 5. But what if, instead of picking one of them, I just decided I'm going to use them all? How would I do that? Well, click on the report menu, select model averaging, and here's what it did. It took an average of all those models. So my prediction is actually averaged from a series of models. This could, this should overall reduce prediction error. 
And furthermore, at this point, I might want to optimize. So I would go to the graph menu. Since I am now um, at the data table and I have saved prediction formulas, I can use the prediction profiler without going to fit model. Okay, so I click on profiler from the graph menu. I'm going to put in my average predictor. This is important in the lower left hand corner, select expand intermediate formulas. Nothing goes in the noise box. That's beyond the scope of this course, so don't put anything there. Just put your prediction formula or formulas in the uh, Y box. And if you're using um, a formula that involves other formulas, you typically want to expand the intermediate estimates. Okay, so here is our model. And by the way, we want to maximize our response. Okay. So what we would do at this point, as we've done in the past, click on Maximize and Remember. So it's going to look through all the models collectively in settings of the input variables to find the best yield. Okay. So notice, after we've done this, it comes up with settings. So if you look, there are your settings. And it's indicating no propanol. It wants uh, the high end of methanol, ethanol, and butanol, a pH of 6 and a time of 2 hours, and the estimated yield is around 51.5. Okay. Remember, in the write-up, anything over 45 would be considered a plus. And also, while we're in here, a feature I like in Jump, it uses some theory from applied math. Okay to assess the importance of the variables themselves. So if you're an engineer optimizing a process, you're often going to get asked, what are the important effects that we need to most tightly control? So I'm going to click on Independent Uniform Inputs. Okay. So JUMP is actually going through some simulation work using something called function decomposition to try to determine what are the most important uh, of the input variables. What is their relative importance to predicting the yield? So optimization, especially in engineering, is typically a critical function. And we'll have more to say about it in uh, future lectures. So based on the analysis, um, JUMP gives you a relative breakdown in the different effects. So it's saying methanol, plus any interactions involving methanol, accounted for about 61% of the variation in yield. Second would be ethanol, then time. And notice pH is relatively small. And also notice something else there appears to be a small block effect, okay, which, might, which sort of is interesting. There shouldn't really be a block effect. But for some reason, um, it does show up. In fact, uh, it, we discussed this in the notes. It appears like there may have been a small um, incremental difference between the two trials. So if we go back and I'll look at the full model, and I'll scroll down and I'll show you what's going on. Here is block. There are two blocks in the average um, difference is almost, uh, I think it's one milligram per liter. So the coefficient is 0.57. So that indicates there was probably an offset between the two different blocks of about one overall milligram. And again, this is actually discussed in the notes. 
Let's see if we can just quickly scroll through the notes which go through what I just did. Okay, so all the discussion is contained within the notes. Okay. And by the way, ethanol and propanol does show up as important. Okay. So we've went gone through all the all possible models analysis. I've done that in a previous video, so I will not do it here. Okay. So this steps you through everything we did. And as I mentioned, the block effect appeared that uh, block one overall, for unknown reasons, was about 1.22 milligrams higher. Uh, we don't exactly know why, but we can show because we had the block variable. We can say overall, between two blocks of runs, you saw a shift of a little over one milligram. Now, whether or not that is important would be entirely up to the engineers. Um, doing the work and what might have caused the shift, there could have been many, many reasons for it, you know, including new raw material, new batch of E. coli. Um, again, you'd have to decide whether to look further. And at this point, this is really important. I would not take these final results and run with them. I would actually do a series of confirmation trials, which we'll, again, reemphasize later on to validate that these gains seem to be real. Okay. And the rest of this we have already talked about. And this really concludes our discussion of analyzing screening designs. Again, we've talked about many types of designs. We're actually going to talk about a few more types of screening designs later on.